Welcome everyone to our Tuesday, March 9th, regular business meeting of the East Bay Mud Board of Directors. Due to COVID-19 and in accordance with the latest Alameda County Health Order and with the Governor's Executive Order not N-2920, which suspends portions of the Brown Act, this meeting will be conducted remotely. In compliance with said orders, a physical location has not been provided for this meeting. These measures will only apply during the period in which state or local health officials have imposed or recommended social distancing. Uh, the Planning and Legislative Human Resources Committees met this morning and will report out under item 17. Uh, all directors, including myself, are participating via teleconference. Uh, roll call, please, Madam Secretary. Director Coleman. Present. Director Katz. Present. Director McIntosh. Here. Director Mellon. Present. Director Patterson. Present. Director Young. I'm here. Chair Linney. Here. Uh, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America. America. And to the republic for which it stands, it stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. All right, we're going to start our meeting today with a presentation. Uh, the California Association of uh, Sanitation uh, Agencies for the 2030 Outstanding Capital Project for the Main Wastewater Treatment Plant primary sedimentation tanks and channel rehabilitation phase five project. Uh, General Manager Clifford Chan will speak and present the award. Thank you, President Lenny. So uh, the main wastewater treatment plant primary sedimentation tanks and channel rehabilitation phase five project received the 2020 Outstanding Capital Project of the Year Award from the California Association of Sanitation Agencies. This $10.1 million construction project demonstrates the accomplishments that can be attained when stewardship, integrity, respect, and teamwork are the guiding principles adopted by a project team. Collaboration between the design, construction, and operations staff resulted in completion of the project 11 months ahead of schedule. This short video highlights the unconventional solutions used to overcome the challenges during the project. I'm Angela L. Pelbani, Construction Manager for East Bay Mud's Main Wastewater Treatment Plant Primary Sedimentation Tanks and Channels Rehabilitation Phase 5 good. Project. Originally, this project was planned to take place over three years during the April to October dry season. The project scope included concrete rehabilitation work in our primary influent and effluent channels and tanks, replacement of old sludge collection equipment, safety improvements, and more. Our initial challenge was gaining access to our primary effluent channel. A 54-inch diameter bypass pipe was constructed during the first year to divert flow around the work area during the remaining years. Rehabilitating concrete in the influent channel was another challenge as deterioration was much worse than expected. Replacement of the channel roof wasn't an option since it provides structural support for a building above. So, we used resurfacing mortar to restore the roof and an innovative carbon fiber wrap system to restore the beams. For every challenge on this project, there was an innovative solution. Our project team, district staff and contractors alike, embodied East Bay Mud's values of stewardship, integrity, teamwork, and respect. The improvements will allow East Bay Mud to continue treating wastewater for nearly 700,000 people along the east shore of San Francisco Bay for decades to come. So I apologize if the sound didn't come through. And then we'll pull up a picture of the uh, award. 
And while we do that, um, I want to congratulate the following project team members, including staff from the Wastewater Engineering, Wastewater Operations, and Regulatory Compliance Divisions. Uh, Joseph Barge, Assistant Wastewater Shift Supervisor. William Chafer, Supervising Construction Inspector. Angela L. Talbany, uh, Associate Civil Engineer. Eric Feberling, Associate Civil Engineer. Joseph Hopkins, Senior Construction Inspector. John Kaiser, Senior Civil Engineer. Edna Leinert, Environmental Health and Safety Specialist 2, Miles Mock, Assistant Engineer, and Jenny Tran, Associate Civil Engineer. Congratulations to all of you. Uh, that's pretty pretty impressive, even without the sound, very impressive uh, video of the work that needs to be done, the challenges that need to be overcome. Uh, Thank you to all, all who participated in that, made it happen uh, and, and ahead of schedule uh, and made us all proud to be uh, members of the East End Light family. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so on to, um, there are no announcements uh, required from closed session. Uh, we're on to public comment. If members of the public wish to speak on agenda or non-agenda items, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. Uh, comments on non-agenda items will be heard at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, and comments on agenda items uh, on, uh, will be heard when the item is up for consideration. When prompted, please state your name, affiliation if applicable, and topic. The secretary will call each speaker in the order received. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to speak. However, I have the discretion to amend this time based on the number of speakers. The secretary will track time and inform each speaker when his or her allotted time has concluded. Uh, do we have anyone addressing us for public comments that are not on the agenda? There is no one for public comment. Oh, all right. Uh, then we will go on to the uh, consent calendar, there are 14 items for consideration. Are there any items to be pulled from the consent calendar for consideration? I would move the consent calendar. I'll, I'll second that. Uh, all right, motion by uh, Director McIntosh, seconded by Director Coleman uh, to for the consent calendar. Um, all in, uh, let's see, we need to do a roll call vote. Yes. Director Coleman? Yes. Director Katz? Yes. Director McIntosh? Yes. Director Mellon? Yes. Director Patterson? Yes. Director Young? Uh, yes. President Linney? Yes. All right, so we are now on to um, determination and discussion. First up is uh, legislative update, uh, Marlene Dumaine. Take it away. There Good afternoon. Uh, we have a written legislative report for you today with four bills for a recommended position and an information item on a legislative bill and also a, a federal update on COVID relief. On the three bills for position, uh, the bills are AB 818 and the validation bills, which are SB 810, 811, and 812. And I wanna pause here in the event that Director Coleman has any comments. Thank you, Mar thank you, Marlene. We did hear this in Ledge Committee and we're in complete agreement with the uh, staff recommendations. I'll hand it back to Marlene. All right. <coughs> All right, um, AB 818 is Assemblymember Bloom's bill on um, flushable wipes. This is a CASA sponsored measure. It may look familiar. Um, the final version of AB 1672 that we had a support position on last year uh, was substantially similar to this measure. Uh, last year it got hung up in, in just the um, backlog of COVID bills and other actions. Uh, what this measure would do is, uh, is implement a labeling requirement for non-flushable wipes. So we're talking about any sort of wipe that you would use in the bathroom that people might think they can flush. Uh, the requirement would be imposed on manufacturers. There's also an education and reporting requirement. 
and there are enforcement provisions that would apply to those that have the responsibility for the labeling. And the idea here is to move towards reducing the number of non-flushable wipes that end up in the sewer system. We think there would be benefits accruing to East Bay Mud and are recommending a support again on this measure. Uh, I have a question. I see that, uh, notice there are penalties. Um, the penalty is for if they don't label it correctly? Correct. Uh, all right, well, I guess that's what they decided. It seems like it's pretty light, $2,500 a day. It's like, just get it done or else we're gonna come down on you, but. Yeah, and I, and I will say that this is a good point to um, bring this up. This, this topic of um, dealing with the non-flushable wipes has been heavily negotiated. Uh, there was there was a measure about five years ago or more that that just failed completely because it was stricter, and so CASA has been working with industry. They've been working with the stewardship council and trying to get to an agreement and get something that they felt could get through the legislature as a first step. So this does represent that compromise. So not surprisingly, the enforcement penalties are are a little bit lower than you might expect. Uh, and if I might interject, Doug, at the committee meeting, I asked, um, since it's been on the agenda twice before, going back to 2010, I think, within Simblom and Huffman, um, if it starts to get derailed, the legislation by chance, over the penalties granted, they are low, that the, the, we then ask that they, if they have to strip that out, they do, so it doesn't fail, but they keep in place the education program and study that could be then used as a basis if need be. I, I'd be surprised if it gets to that point, but sort of as a backup. All right. All right. Oh. We want to, any other discussion on this item? We want to take these one at a time or? Can we pass all? four items out of ledge committee with uh, unanimity. Nobody disagreed. Okay. Uh, well, Marlene, why don't you, uh, you want to give any update on our, any discussion on the other bills? Sure. Um, SB 810, 811, and 812, these are the Validations Act that you see um, each and every year. Uh, this is the state's effort to validate actions by local governments. Um, most notably bonds. If there's a procedural error, an inadvertent error in a bond that say any spay mud or other local government issued, these validation acts would back that up and allow them to remain valid so they don't end up getting invalidated. And it's, it's a, something that the state does every year and we're recommending a support again. And I will move all four legislative items. Second. All right, we have a motion by Director Coleman, seconded by Director Patterson. Uh, all in favor, um, signify to the secretary. Roll she call calls vote. Roll. Yes. Director Coleman? Yes. Director Katz? Yes. Director McIntosh? Yes. Director Mellon? Yes. Director Patterson? Yes. Director Young? Yes. President Linney. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, information item uh, AB 361. Uh, this is about teleconferencing. And the reason we're bringing this forward today is you may recall in our ledge initiatives for 2020 and 2021, there was an initiative to uh, pursue waiving the quorum requirement for teleconferencing that requires a quorum of the board to be present within the service area when meeting by teleconference to ratify or declare an emergency. When we first started exploring getting this change in law, it was before COVID and we nosed around a little bit. And I will tell you, it went over like a lead balloon. People weren't interested. And then um, two months later, <laughs> we did, and we saw uh, a lot of executive orders and the governor um, 
waived some Brown Act requirements, including that one, to facilitate local government meetings during COVID. What this bill would do is codify that so it would, during an emergency that's declared by the state or local government, and by local government, they mean county or city, um, that a, a governing body of an agency like East Bay Mud could meet by teleconference and the quorum would not have to be present within the service area in order to declare or ratify an East Bay Mud declared emergency. Um, this, this topic is under a lot of discussion in the legislature. There's another teleconferencing bill out there that I wanted to let you know about. And, and that would waive that quorum requirement, period. So it would be a, a governing body meeting by teleconference, even outside of an emergency could meet and the quorum would not have to be located within the service area. That's one extreme. Um, this is the other extreme on these teleconferencing bills. Stakeholders are talking right now and there are varying perspectives. One is facilitating meetings for local government. The other is the transparency piece. And there is a concern out there about going to teleconferencing. So these conversations are gonna to need to come together and to coalesce uh, before we're ready to recommend a position for you. So at this point, we wanted to let you know that the conversations are happening and the concept that we were hoping to advance is in the mix. Any questions on that one? Yeah, any sense of urgency now that uh, the light at the end of the tunnel is no longer a heat-seeking sidewinder missile? Um, not, not really. Um, we are, we're seeing uh, policy committee hearings being scheduled. The legislature has taken some early budget actions. They may take some more um, relative to what I'm going to tell you in a minute about at the federal level, um, but they are turning their focus to policy committee hearings. And that's sort of regular course of business. And the teleconferencing bills um, are being scheduled for hearing. So normal course, but being taken seriously. Thank you. You're welcome. On, on the federal, I wanted to uh, let you know that the latest COVID relief package is working its way through Congress. Uh, the bill number is HR 1319. It passed out of the Senate over the weekend. It's now with the House. It's a $1.9 trillion COVID relief measure. And uh, just before the board meeting, the final language was sent over to the house and made available. So we can finally see what it looks like. Uh, but what we do know, we haven't had a chance to review it, but what we do know is that uh, 1319 has an additional $500 million in rate assistance for utility rates. So that would be water and wastewater arrearages. That's on top of the 638 million nationwide that was in HR 33 that was enacted late last year. Uh, the rate assistance money from HR 133 has not yet been allocated to the states. And we're hearing that there's some conversation at the federal level that there may be a desire to take all of the rate assistance money and push it out at the same time. So we may be looking at it accruing to the state uh, in the next month or so. Uh, we are continuing to advocate that money be allocated to all water and wastewater utilities that have eligible rate payers based on the proportion of eligible rate payers in their service area. There are conversations also within the state about taking the rate assistance money and using it to help out uh, failing utilities or utilities that are on the brink of failure. So whether or not any money accrues to East Bay Mud, uh, we don't know yet, but we are, we are certainly trying. Marlene, uh, Director Coleman has his hand raised. Yes. Thank you, Clifford. Marlene, quick question on the rate assistance money from the federal side. Is it specifically for water and wastewater or does it include 
energy considering the fiasco that happened in Texas? The, the, the pots that I just mentioned, the 500 million uh -huh. and 638 million, that's water and wastewater utility or rearages. Only, okay. Other pots that would be open to electricity. Okay, great. Thank you for the answer. Sure. Uh, Director Young has her hand, her hand raised. Yeah, um, what, remind us, what's the, so it, that's a little bit over a billion dollars total in between the two packages? That's correct. So, and what's, what's the, I just saw, we, California just put out an estimate, um, you know, a couple weeks ago or last, recently about the arrearage in, in California. Right. Um, What's the, I mean, how does that a billion stack up to the, to the need that uh, we think there is? Obviously, California is just one, right. one state. It, it, you know, it stacks up like a lot of the, the, the relief pots that have, have um, been decided upon where the need is greater than the assistance that's coming through. Um, the State Water Board survey on arrearages was done last October, and they're estimating about a billion dollars. Um, but the number is a little confusing because there's, it, it's not really an apples and apples in how they did the survey. So conventional wisdom as of October was somewhere around 600 million at the state level. And when we look at what they're doing at the federal level with these relief packages, um, you're right, Director Young, it's a little over a billion. It's about 1.1 billion and change. So allocation, if you assume California gets somewhere around 10% of that, that's only about 110 million. So not even close to the total need. And so um, you can imagine there's a lot of competition for, for that money and a lot of um, um, concepts on who should allocate and how it should be allocated. Yeah. Uh, quickly, the other pots that are in the um, in the HR thirteen nineteen that we expect to pass out of the house this week, um, there are about three hundred and fifty billion for state and local assistance, and by local they mean cities and counties. Uh, within that, um, there is a provision that would allow them to transfer funds to uh, special purpose local governments like a special district such as East Bay Mud. Again, I'll remind you that the need tends to be greater than the amount of relief. So competition and prioritization would be such that um, we may not see any money accrue from that, but those provisions are there. Uh, emergency rental relief, there's another 21 billion here. That also includes uh, rental arrears, utilities, including water and wastewater. And Director Coleman, home energy costs are in here and home energy cost arrearages. And there's also 10 billion for homeowner assistance. And that is to deal with mortgage delinquencies, defaults, foreclosures, loss of utilities or home energy services. And at the state level on the rental arrearages, uh, the way the arrearages from HR 133 uh, are being prioritized. Rental arrearages go first, and then any sort of utility arrearages would be secondary to those rental arrearages. Again, a lot of competition for uh, a, a small amount of money. Any questions? Although if somebody ends up being better with their with a roof over their head, they're they're also ending up being better in you know, paying off their other utility debts, right? So it, it does kind of, one does affect the other. Any other questions, comments, Marlene? Is that your report? That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we are on to 
uh, general manager's report. Okay, I have um, four items, and uh, for the first item, I'm, I'm not telling you anything that you aren't already experiencing, but we're not getting the miracle march that we're hoping for. Um, besides um, uh, some rain today and tomorrow, it looks like it might be dry for the next week. Dave Briggs, Director of Operations, will give you the full water supply update. Good afternoon, President Laney and members of the board. I'll, I'll give you the best numbers we have and the most accurate forecast we have in the next few minutes. So we'll first just review our, our water production numbers, and that's shown in red here for this fiscal year. And as typically happens in the spring, it'll, it'll bounce around a little bit as it responds to changes in temperature and precipitation. But all in all, our, our best forecast for our production numbers this year, okay, thanks, Janetta. Uh, our best uh, forecast for the production numbers this year is still gonna put us about one or 2% ahead of last year. And that's uh, factoring in, of course, the pandemic and a, and a, and a possible dry year. Uh, that, that number is still the best number we have. Okay, so our, our, uh, let's look at the precipitation. And what we're showing here is the Upper McKellamy Forest Station Index. This is from last week. Uh, it's numbers through March 2nd. So uh, this is showing 19 inches to date, 56% of average. And uh, last week it was next to nothing for March. But uh, since uh, over the weekend, we picked up about four tenths of an inch. And the forecast has us picking up, so let's say the 10-day forecast, the 10-day outlook has us picking up approximately another inch, maybe an inch and a half. Now that might sound good, uh, but that is still tracking well below even a dry hydrology for this time of year. So uh, even if we update this chart to today's conditions, which is closer to about 19 and a half, we're still at 56% of average to date. And the forecast for the next week or two uh, doesn't look particular, particularly productive. So we're going to keep tracking this dry trend overall. Now, locally, not good. 33% uh, locally here. We did pick up four tenths also on Friday night here in the Bay Area, or at least uh, in Oakland and Berkeley, and uh, picked up a little bit on March. We've got another inch forecasted in the next seven to 10, to 10 days here locally. So that's still, uh, so let's say halfway through March, we're going to be about 50% uh, of March if we're lucky. So we're continuing to track uh, very dry here as well. And the better number we have is our, our depth of our snow. It, this is one data point at uh, 8,000 feet up in the watershed. This is at least uh, resembling something close to normal. The red line is the snowpack to date. A little uh, 75 percent of the orange dash line, which is the historical average. Uh, we do have a snowpack, uh, but it's confined to the upper elevations. And just you can compare the blue line at the bottom, uh, the snowpack we had in 2015, which was considerably smaller. So we will benefit from the runoff when this snow melts, but it is uh, confined to the upper parts of the watershed. And then. As I mentioned, uh, that depth of snow is about 75, 76% of normal, and that corresponds also to a water content about 76% of normal. If we look at the pan out, look at the whole state and the Sierra, we see that the central, the central Sierra is 68% of normal. That's the best area that, uh, that we have. To the north, it's closer to 60%, and to the south, considerably worse. Uh, Bureau of Reclamation is sticking with its allocations that we communicated two weeks ago, 55% for municipal and industrial. Uh, so that uh, will translate to about 73,000 acre feet for East Bay Mud should we trigger that contract and schedule the water. Uh, state water contractors, I think, are still at 10% with, uh, if they go anywhere, they'll probably go lower. And so the Department of Water Resources is probably going to be very active this year with the Dry year, water for, uh, dry year water transfer program, moving a lot of water from the Sacramento Valley through the Delta and out the export pumps to try to let those contractors make ends meet. So here's our storage, and it's been trending down. We're at uh, 551,000 uh, or so acre feet for total system storage. The biggest uh, deficits we have are locally. And we just initiated a few days ago uh, a, a, a system-wide operation to refill our storage locally. 
Uh, we really used our local supplies uh, heavily this winter to operate around construction upcountry. And also we haven't gotten much refill here based on the lack of rainfall. So we're the biggest uh, problem we have is locally. Now we're also mindful that if we trigger the Freeport operation later this year, we need room down here to help moderate that flow and moderate uh, those quantities of water. So uh, we're keeping all of that in mind and making sure that uh, our operations now with local refill will, will be compatible with anything we might do moving down the road. Okay, so let's get into some specifics about where we are right now and where we may be going. And uh, so this chart here, uh, let's spend some time on this one. Uh, the grayish light blue bar on the far left is precip to date in the, uh, in the watershed for 2021, for this year. And the other 10 bars are the precipitation for the entire year uh, for the next, uh, or for the 10 driest years that we have on our historical record. So considering where we are right now, about 19 inches of precipitation in the watershed, if we add on top of that a 90%, which is shown in red crosshatch there, a 90% hydrology on top of that, which is to say that 90% of the years uh, that we have on, on record will produce at least that much uh, rainfall uh, for the next two or two and a half months or so. If we get that 90% amount of rain, that dry year amount of rain, which corresponds to about seven inches, well, we at least won't be, we'll be above 1977. Um, the median hydrology, which represents about 10 more inches of precipitation, will keep us in the dry year club, but at least not there, you know, towards the left-hand side of this chart. So statistically, those are very possible. Uh, it, these are likely amounts of precipitation, especially the 90% that we might receive. However, as I, I'll, I'll show you shortly, we just don't tend to be trending uh, uh, even the dry hydrology lately and in the next two weeks. So uh, that, that has us a little bit of concern. So this is pretty much the exact same data, but just formatted a slightly different way. So we're at 19 inches, or at least we were last week. We picked up another half inch or so over the weekend. And looking at the hydrologies moving forward, uh, the, the dry year hydrology uh, has us uh, picking up another six, seven inches of rain. That'll put us above 1977. The wet hydrology will still have us far below average. And we'll probably end up somewhere in between. Uh, but right now, we're still tracking that, that dry hydrology line. So let me get a little bit more specific with our end of, end of season storage here. And... So what we're showing here is we're starting at about 550,000 acre feet. And this, this line was updated through last week when we sent the slides out to the board. And it's showing that the dry hydrology, the red line, so 90% of the year statistically should be wetter than this, that has us ending at 490,000 acre feet of carryover storage. However, there's two caveats to this. One is that in the week that just elapsed since we sent you this slide, we just updated this, these lines this morning, the new 90% hydrology line is actually tracking closer to 465, 460, 465. Because even though we did pick up a half of an inch of rain in the last week, that is below a 90% exceedance. It's a very dry, for March, that is not a lot of rain for a week in March. The other aspect that's of note is that the next 10 days of precip also are not following that 90% hydrology line. They're trending a little lower than that. Now things could change. We still realistically have two and a half months left out of this water year, and April could turn around. Uh, we could, the storm door does remain open. We do not see a strong high ridge blocking everything from getting to California, but we're just waiting for a storm to cross the Pacific and walk through the door. So there is time. Uh, but uh, the last week and the next two weeks uh, don't look particularly good. And I'll, I'll close with just perhaps framing things in the way that Director Coleman uh, asked uh, last board meeting. We need five inches of rain from, let's say, today, March 9th. We need five more inches of rain upcountry to get us to 450,000 acre feet of carryover storage. Five. We need six and a half to get us to 475. And we need about seven and a half, eight to get us to 500,000 acre feet of carryover storage. All very doable, but the next two weeks we are not following 
uh, that trend, if, if, that's, if that's clear. So that's where we are. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, if not, we'll be back in two weeks with our next, uh, our next round of numbers. Any questions? George Coleman? Yeah, thank you. And thank you, David, for the update. I appreciate it. <clears throat> what discussions may be ensuing on the state level in terms of the drought that we're in and where we're heading for, I know that their final snow numbers are in April and things could change dramatically. And if they don't, is the state water board starting to talk about what they may do because during the last drought, um, they impose conditions on all agencies, even though we, at the time, we were in better shape than many agencies. So is that, to, is that have those discussions begun yet? So uh, uh, Director Coleman, I'm, I'm turning around looking at Mike Tognolini for any, uh, for any body language, but as, as far as I know, those discussions have started in Sacramento, but they've only been discussions. And a lot of the state policymakers are waiting until we at least get in the first week of April uh, before making any sort of formal statements. Looks like Mike must be in the lake there. <laughs> uh, I'm here, and uh, yes, uh, just to <laughs> echo what Dave said, there have been preliminary discussions and hearings at the state board, but they're like us, waiting to see how the rest of the of the spring turns out before any any uh, definitive actions get taken. And are how are the state and federal reservoirs? I mean, our reservoirs are in relatively decent shape considering what we're in. How are the state and federal, how's the state and federal system, uh, what kind of shape there are they in, in terms of the percent of storage currently and expected storage of the current circumstances? So uh, Director Coleman, if you look at all the storage reservoirs right now, most of those reservoirs uh, in the mountains are obviously in, uh, uh, serve a flood control role as well. So right. none of them are full. Uh, they're all probably about 75, 65% of capacity right now. And the question is, you know, if, is there any snow that's going to be refilling them? So uh, I think storage levels are probably not way off the mark right now, uh, but the problem is there's no snow to refill them. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions, comments, Dave? No, uh, I, I'm all done. Yep, thank you, Dave. Okay, so... Um... Next up, uh, as uh, Director Mellon noted, um, the light at the end of the COVID tunnel does seem a bit brighter and we're seeing more positive news. So we'll share with you today some of the most uh, recent information uh, from the counties that we work in um, and also talk about our safe re return to work plans. But I will say on that last point, uh, we'll have more details to share with the board at a future board meeting uh, and Dave will make this update as well. Okay, hello again, good afternoon. And I, I, I love the optimistic thinking. Uh, that's very helpful. So as is typical, the state updated the stat, everyone's status at, at noon today, and that placed two of our counties, Alameda and Calaveras, into the red tier. Our remaining counties are, are uh, still in purple. Uh, so that's progress. That was good to see. The, just about every pandemic-related metric continues to improve. Now, the rate of improvement is not as, as strong or significant as it was about a month ago, but nonetheless, just about every metric you want to look at, locally, statewide, even nationally, they continue to trend downward. So that's, that's a very, very good sign. Uh, there's been no changes to our safety protocols. However, I will caveat that with uh, recent guidance from the CDC with respect to those persons who have been vaccinated. And that guidance generally falls into two categories. First, uh, under very narrow circumstances, those people uh, who have been vaccinated have relaxed requirements for wearing face coverings and social distancing. But again, those are in very narrow circumstances. None of that guidance has been picked up by local health orders. So as far as we're concerned at East Bay Mud, it's face covering all the time, everybody, and every rule still applies as well as social distancing. So even though the CDC may be uh, creating some guidance out there. We are still very conservative here at East Bay Mud. Uh, the second area of note from the CDC that has been picked up locally is that those persons who have been vaccinated under narrow circumstances are not obligated to quarantine. 
And we have picked up that and incorporated that into our methods. Uh, so those are the only changes that we see. Still no significant impacts on us operationally. And our latest numbers, uh, so we, have, we, we got our 73rd this morning. That was confirmed, still 12 contractors. And of those 73, all but three have returned to work. Our quarantine numbers are quite low. Uh, only about seven people are actively quarantining right now. And if you recall some of the numbers that we've given you in prior updates, uh, those numbers were in the upper 20s. So all of these things are good. The latest information on vaccination, I think the state's latest number is almost 11 million uh, doses administered throughout the state. That's averaging about a million and a half per week. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is now available. Uh, most of the logistics at vaccination sites, whether they're operated by FEMA or the state or locally or Kaiser, have been ironed out to a large degree. Uh, I've not heard of anybody coming back with a nightmare story about how complicated it was to sign up or how the site was was unprofessionally managed, et cetera. I, I've generally heard good uh, stories from how these places are managed. And the state last week, as the board is probably aware, dedicated 40% of the available vaccine to those vulnerable and disadvantaged communities. And that's good strategy. Uh, you probably know that to progress through the colored tier system, those neighborhoods, those zip codes, those disadvantaged communities have an independent metric. And if they're not improving along with the countywide average, the county stays where it is. So those are the people who are most affected by the coronavirus, the highest positivity rates, the highest hospitalization rates. So targeting vaccine to these areas is, is smart and everybody wins because it makes the counties progress that much faster based on these sort of shared metrics. So that's, uh, that's already in play. And you probably also heard that there was a, huh, only a handful of zip codes in the Bay Area that were part of the over 400 that were identified in the state. There was a couple in East Oakland, one or two in Richmond. We had a handful in Calaveras County, uh, but just really not, not a high number of, of these areas located in the Bay Area by, by far and away. Uh, most of these areas, uh, based on the state's uh, metric system, were identified in the Central Valley, the rural counties up north, and in Southern California. Uh, the board is also aware that we are, we are attempting to get some of our workers qualified under Phase 1B as emergency service workers. So those staff that actively support firefighting and keeping the water system pressurized on a daily basis, those, those workers can qualify, so we're still trying to make that happen to make sure we get the opportunities for our workers to get vaccinated if they, if they wish to. The, the education of the benefits of vaccinations is a, is a big effort. We're really starting to gear up for this year, uh, identifying those educational opportunities, speakers, employee testimonials, and just trying to get the word out uh, to try to improve our numbers for those that might be uh, how, that have vaccine hesitancy, I think is the term, and try to influence those numbers and increase our numbers. And I think in two, two and a half months or so, uh, based on the availability and the, and the vaccine rates and the, num the percentage of the population that wishes to be vaccinated, I think we're going to see this crossover point in two, may, I don't know, maybe late May, early June, where uh, the number of people who want to be vaccinated uh, it'll be about on par with the amount of vaccine actually available. Lines will be short and it should be readily available to those people interested. So uh, following an optimistic set of assumptions uh, with things continuing to get better and not reversing like has happened before, but if we truly are on a steady march out of this, as we mentioned last time, we are, we are really going to put pen to paper here and try to get our safe return to workplace plan worked out. And what will guide this plan, of course, the, the cornerstone of the plan will, the be, will be to keep our workers safe. And many, many elements go into that, including PPE and modifying workspaces so that people stay apart from each other, uh, maintaining training. Um, it, is, it has been a marathon. Uh, the rules are complicated. Employees are tired. Some employees think that we're already done. So this constant uh, reminder and reinforcement and education is needed to keep our work, uh, workers safe. But also as we begin to return to some level of normalcy around here, 
we're going to be extremely watchful of any employee to employee transmission. We're very, very proud of our record to date. Uh, and credit goes to HR, credit goes to all the employees. If we see any sign of employee to employee transmission as we start to, well, at any time, either whether it's today or moving forward, uh, that's an all hands on deck review of the situation. Of course, the other guidance for our plan will be uh, the metrics around us, uh, improving pandemic numbers. Uh, we'll be mindful of what the county is telling us and what the county allows, and any school reopening uh, that we know is still a burden on, on many employees with, with school still virtual in, in many areas. Uh, just some specifics to put out here. Uh, really, we're gonna need to be prescriptive about occupancy levels in the building and that's tied to telecommuting. We'll move incrementally. We'll give employees due notice if there's any changes so that everyone's prepared for any changes. But these plans have got to contain the specifics about how many people can be in a conference room and whether or not two employees can jump in a car together and carpool to a, a work site or what types of services we may allow inside the building uh, with, uh, at a given time. So all of these things, need, all these details will be worked out in the plan and of course, the, I think as, as Clifford mentioned last time, uh, and following a question, there, there will be, the board will have its own plan uh, for returning uh, to the workplace. And that one is gonna be tricky. Uh, we have tricky geometry in the boardroom, at, especially at the dais. And as Marlene was covering, some legislation is pending related to telecommuting and the Brown Act. So the board uh, will have a tricky plan and Risha and Clifford will, will walk you through that in the next uh, month or so. Uh, so just to, uh, just to underscore that we will try to get a written plan pulled together and share that with employees and unions for feedback well in advance, and we're actively working on that. And then I'll close with just a, a refresher of this, of this system that the state has had in place for about six months now, so that's good. We haven't, we haven't changed systems in a while. That's helpful. And just wanted to highlight uh, in the, right, the, the far right column uh, when you look at the blueprint for a safer economy and you browse through it, it, it delineates what is and what is not allowable by color type, depending on what business you're in. Uh, one of those 40 or 50 or so business types is quote unquote office workspace. So if you look at that, you can see that under the purple and red tier, telecommuting is essentially required more or less, but as you progress into orange and yellow with appropriate modifications indoors and safety protocols, telecommuting is essentially encouraged and not required. So we'll be following this very closely and using this as a primary source of guidance as we uh, attempt to get back to normal here at, at East Bay Mud. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Director Coleman. Yeah, thank you. My question or comment is uh, probably more for Cliff and, and Mike Toplin. Um, I've been walking the Lafayette Reservoir frequently and becoming, and I, and I relate this to Cliff, becoming quite distressed uh, by the increasing frequency of people not wearing masks. Now, I have no problems if somebody has a mask off, they put it on and they, they walk by you. That's, I, that, I'm cool with that. But uh, Sunday, it was probably 10 to 20% of the people I saw on the trail were maskless. In a couple of cases, I said, you know, you should put your mask on. And I was described to do things in very colorful terms. Um, so I said, forget it. I'm not a cop. However, um, because of what's happening in some states and some people are getting the vaccinations and some people feel entitled that they don't need to wear a mask to begin with, we're going to see probably increasing frequency of people disregarding the rules. And um, we get over a million visitors every year. And there's some people I now who know who will not go there because of the mask issue. And they've complained in the past. And in the past, people were pretty compliant. But it, the trend each week is more and more people are not wearing a mask. So Clifford, if you could relate to me and the board what you're going to, what we're going to be doing. I, I don't want to be a cop. I don't want our employees necessarily to be cops, but it's not, it's heading in the wrong direction there and it's sending the wrong signal. Yeah, and, and what you had out there was a very unfortunate experience. And what, you know, what we're seeing is there's a lot of positive news out there. Um, but you know, I, I, on the other hand, 
many more people haven't been vaccinated than have been vaccinated, which is why we still require the masks, which is why the county and the CDC are still recommending people wearing masks, um, especially with those guidelines. Um, I did have a chance to talk to Mike Tognolini, and um, we are going to have the park district out there to do some more patrolling, especially of the trails, uh, specifically talking about enforcement of the, um, the mask requirements. Um, and hopefully that will, um, uh, we'll see an improvement. And, and I think it also depends on uh, when you're out there. Again, you know, you, you had a very bad experience out there. I was talking to Mike Tognolini, and, and he was out there um, just the other day, and uh, he noticed pretty good uh, mask compliance. So I think it varies, but I think it's also important that um, we get the park district out there to do some more enforcement, which we're going to do, um, and they'll be out there to do that. Thank you. And if we could just keep, uh, I mean, I know we're understaffed there, quite frankly, for all the efforts that we need to do and activities. But um, I, it, it bothers me when, and it's usually younger people, quite frankly, under the age of 35 who are want, deciding they don't need to do it. And, you know, I, I look at it as being no different if, you know, those are the rules required by the CDC in the county, in the state. And, um, I just find it egregious when people feel that they don't need to follow those rules and they may be asymptomatic and not know it and be passing it on to somebody who is following the guidelines and the mask for whatever reason may not protect them. Yeah. So I, I if you can do a, an update, maybe at the next meeting, I would appreciate that. Uh, we'll, we'll do that. And, and uh, Mike, would you like to add anything else to what I said? Uh, yeah, thanks, Clifford. No, I, I think you've covered it. I would just add that we've asked our staff, again, in situations where they feel safe and it's appropriate to, uh, like the East Bay Parks patrols, to also remind patrons that they should be wearing their masks. Yeah, and, and the mask usage is pretty good along the dam. And when people start the trails, when they start walking, and maybe it gets foggy on their glasses or they feel they can't breathe, it's as they start going around the reservoirs when the masks start coming off, I've noticed. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have signage out there? We do. Okay. Yeah, we have a, a, quite a bit of signage. I think we've saturated the signage, and I'm not sure that more signage would really make a difference there. Uh, my experience, as Clifford noted yesterday, uh, I was out, went, I walked a trail yesterday morning, and uh, I would say, 100% um, compliance. Either everyone had a mask. I saw encountered about 50 people. Three people did not have a mask on, but they kept six feet away. So um, they were complying with the the signage and what we've asked them to do uh, at least yesterday morning. Okay. Director Mellon. Yeah. The the issue of the masks is is a craziness. I mean, I I do try to go walking five or six times a week, and it's usually along uh, the Bay Trails. And, uh, you know, I see a lot of people without the masks, and the times I've made a comment or two, I had to put my head back on the shoulders after it got chewed off. Uh, they, there's really uh, an arrogance level out there. And then when you drive up country, John, it's really amazing. So. Well, yeah, I, I was in Arnold all last week, and in the stores, everybody was in, was complying and stuff. Last week, it's be, actually it was better up there than it had been months ago. But if you go outside the stores, maybe that's worse. Well, I've I've gone up to Grizzly Flat a few times over the past couple months, uh, and you know I wear the mask, and I get people looking at me cross-eyed. Of course. I also see the signs that say Republic of Jefferson. Um, so I can't say much about that. But the thing I think is, and, and I'm going to do a mea culpa here, if there's nobody else on the trail, I take the mask off. You know? And But somebody starts to approach me, I put the mask back on. Uh, and I, but to me, it's, it's easier to breathe. Well, I, I do, don't disagree with you, Frank, and I have no problems if somebody's walking on the trail with the mask off. And there are people who will put it back on when they're passing you. And then there are other people who don't even have a, who have it hanging down or it's out of their pocket. And some people you don't even see having a mask. Whatever, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to be the 
the mass cop, but it's going to get worse as pe more people get vaccinated and as more things open up and you see what some states are doing saying you don't need a mask. By the way, amongst us, uh, I got my second shot last week. How's everybody else doing? Two shots, one shot? Zero. Some of us aren't 65. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I celebrated my diamond birthday, so there. <laughs> okay. Well, well, on, on the mass front. Uh, to, to John's comment, you know, I, I think, uh, uh, to, to chime in on John's comment, I think it is uh, uh, worthwhile if, if uh, our staff experience is concurrent with that, um, just to, to, to make sure that we have um, a, a good understanding of a trend. I think John's report back is sufficient too, uh, to, to share with the county health departments in, in those respective uh, counties, what uh, what we've observed on our property, and uh, so that so that those uh, county health departments who uh, have that uh, charge of guiding um, the health response can communicate with us if they've had similar impressions on other public property, uh, they may share uh, their enforcement guidance with uh, uh, with us. They may communicate this this pattern to uh, their county sheriffs. And, and that we may learn something um, about public health promotion and outreach. Um, it, it does seem like this is really a question of uh, social acceptance of norms and signage is probably the best we can do. Uh, but maybe we learn at a certain point that we need to improve our signage, not necessarily have more, but have more specific signage. Uh, that's like, no, even no, we're, we're still in that emergency. May, maybe the public health professionals uh, find it uh, helpful to improve signage um, as as um, uh, pandemic fatigue sets in. And, and we're on calls with the county up to two times a week, and, and we can certainly share that information as well. And we'll come back and provide an update on um, what we're seeing out at the reservoir sites and other facilities. Thank you very much. I, I had a, um, unrelated to the reservoir question, uh, on the issue of uh, voluntary reporting by our employees on whether they got vaccinations or not. When when Dave was talking about uh, the fact that now if you have a vaccination, you have to go into quarantine, um, obviously would be uh, useful to know that information of how many of our employees are still may still need to use quarantine time and those who might not. What, what's the status of that? Um, it, we shared with staff that they have to report their um, uh, vaccination status after they receive the final, um, their final vaccine. Um, we're not characterizing this as voluntary. Okay. And you'll be happy to know, Andy, I, when I walk the reservoir and I have a big sign that says, East Bay Mud, I'm Director Katz. <laughs> 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 and and did everyone receive uh, their masks in the mail? Yes, mine yes. came yesterday. Um, right. I haven't checked my mailbox yet. Okay, I will wear it at the reservoir. Yeah, mine without says Director Coleman. Without, without, a, without a badge. <laughs> <laughs> I wear my Dodgers mask, but it doesn't get the same reaction. Okay. Are, are there any other questions on on this particular item? Okay, um, moving on, um, next is our monthly update on the racial equity and justice uh, and diversity equity and inclusion activities. Um, I will uh, just kind of give you some, uh, you know, uh, sharing that at our April board meeting, um, we will present to you the findings um, from the work that the Winters Group has done. And we'll also provide some more details about our mid and long range plans and strategies. I know with some of these presentations, uh, you may feel a little lost on where things are, so we'll, we'll provide a little more detail on that. Um, and with that, I'll pass it off to Derry Moten, our Manager of Employee and Organizational Development, to give you the update. Good afternoon, board members. We'll uh, proceed with the uh, uh, presentation here. So um, what we'll be covering here is we'll go over the uh, updates we have on the Racial Equity and Justice Projects. And the, again, the four key projects that we've been working on separate from the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Strategic Plan. We'll give you a, an update on how the plan uh, development is proceeding. As Clifford mentioned, the Winters Group will be uh, making a presentation to us next month with their findings on our uh, internal audit. Um, next, we'll be talking about the new Office of Diversity, Equity, and Development, and then we'll give you kind of an overview on kind of our next steps that we're moving for 
forward with so far. So on our existing racial equity and justice projects uh, for strategy one, which is uh, our listening sessions and listening to employees, um, our staff has continued to do some training with uh, our affinity group leaders and district advocates, specifically around building lift listening skills. The, uh, so far, the training has uh, been very well received. The uh, two sessions that were done with that group are now going to be leveraged into uh, more listening sessions with uh, the affinity groups as we're moving forward. We also are scheduling a uh, joint session with the APEA and uh, BEN members, which is our Asian Pacific Employees Association and Black Employee Network memberships, to have some discussion about um, our, our overall culture toward uh, addressing some of the challenges that recently happened in Chinatown with the attacks of some several of the um, Asian elders in, in the area. We will be having some dialogue about that and looking at how can we uh, continue to address that internally in terms of, of, of our own cultural education between the groups and also if there are opportunities for external um, uh, work on this matter as well. For strategy six, which is addressing our um, employees that uh, face racism or bias in the uh, uh, course of executing their plans, our response team has continued to meet and work out details on, on their practices. So that process is continuing to move forward. And for strategy seven and eight, our task forces have continued their discussions with law enforcement agencies. And again, the uh, data we've been getting back has been very strong in terms of uh, partnership and how we're uh, moving forward. For the development of the strategic plan, we've gone through a series of things with the Winters Group and with their subcontractor, OG Racial Equity. The Winters Group has been doing uh, the data collection uh, for the internal scans. And as was mentioned, they'll be providing their data uh, coming up pretty soon here. That data will have a series of findings and some recommendations that they have for us organizationally on things that we can do with our, our existing programs um, for diversity, equity, inclusion. We also, with the uh, subcontractor OG Racial Equity, have been going through a series of trainings, which have now led to our core team and SMT members working on five pilot projects and looking at how can we apply a racial equity lens to these projects. The goal of the projects is for these five projects to then lead into specific tangible actions that we will integrate into the strategic plan going forward. So this will have us looking at five specific areas that this covers is number one, uh, looking at our approach to our capital infrastructure investments, how those, how decisions are made, uh, whether there is any equity issue, there, whether there are any equity issues and how we're applying um, uh, our overall capital planning process uh, to projects. Number two is our process for community engagement, looking at uh, how can we continue to, to engage our communities and equally engaged communities all across the service area. Number three is looking at contracts and procurement and doing an assessment about how we're doing, number one, and then also looking at are there greater opportunities for us to continue to um, take our contract equity process and, and expand that process so that we can continue to um, uh, meet expectations in terms of, of um, women and minority owned business engagement. We'll be looking at our hiring recruitment practices and then also our promotion and retention practices as well. And again, part of this is these, using some very foundational data that uh, the Winters Group has, uh, preliminary data rather, that the Winters Group has made available and some of our additional internal data in order to look at our current practices and look at some of our outcomes around uh, both hiring and promotion. So the process that the teams will be using uh, is a multi-step process, which is based on the, the Government Alliance for Racial Equity, um, uh, Racial Equity Toolkit. Uh, that kit has us actually working through, uh, each, each of the teams working through a multi-step process. The step one is looking and defining the intended outcomes that we have for each one of those five projects and our long-term work on those. Number two is doing some additional data collection. So the Winters Group has done some data collection, but then each group is being asked to look at alternative and additional sources of data that we can uh, begin the collection process and look at that. And that ranges anywhere from looking at census data to looking specifically at other external uh, data points that we can uh, 
we can tap into. Uh, next, we'll be in doing some additional engagement with in, in, uh, impacted parties and stakeholders, and this specifically is around an external scan, uh, reaching out and doing some additional uh, connection and contact with uh, parties that are connected to uh, each of the five processes that we're looking at. And then five is, in, uh, next thing is then developing our long-term long -term strategies to address equity issues and any type of policy or process changes or improvements that we need to do in any of those areas. Those will then be integrated into the strategic plan for work over the next three to five years. For the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Development, uh, we have started some uh, very basic team building uh, for existing staff. We have uh, recently just did a, a meet and greet with all of uh, the staff of the three groups that will be coming together, uh, giving them a chance to get to know the work. There were some immediate, with their introductions, some immediate opportunities that each of them saw for, um, for collaboration and uh, ways that they can work together. Uh, we will be inviting a third party uh, facilitator to come in and actually do an additional team building process with us uh, that will focus on how we can identify additional opportunities, uh, identify and document additional opportunities for collaboration. How can we look at the team culture that we wanna establish with these groups and then also how we participate in the uh, DEI strategy projects in terms of each, of each of the team members being aware of the projects and making sure that they find ways to connect with those as we're developing. So our project schedule, we're continuing to move forward. Again, listening sessions, we've been continuing to do. We're looking at those continuing through the month of, of uh, June. As I mentioned, the uh, Black Employee Network and Asian Pacific uh, group will be doing kind of a joint session uh, in the coming weeks. The planning session for that is actually this Thursday. Uh, for strategy six, we're doing the finalization of the protocols and uh, having the staff training will be rolling out very soon. Uh, for strategy seven to eight, the task forces again continue to meet and uh, uh, developing of their final recommendations for the interviews that they pulled from interviews with the law enforcement uh, agencies. And then for our other four strategies, as the Winters Group is providing us data back, we'll be looking in depth at the additional four straight, uh, strategies, which are part of phase three of this. And this will give us an opportunity to take uh, the, the information that we're receiving from Winters and integrate it into these four strategies that the board identified when we uh, began this in June. And then finally, for the diversity and inclusion strategic, strategic plan, the teams are currently working on their processes for roughly about 12 weeks that will put us into the month of July and we're looking at August being when we have the uh, final plan done in terms of the uh, DEI strategic plan that we'll be moving forward with. And again, when we have received the data from uh, Winters and they make the presentation to you next uh, week, you will, uh, next month rather, you will have an opportunity to, again, to ask them any questions and to clarify a couple of items as we move forward. So our next steps that we're focused on Again, we're gonna continue our implementation on the existing uh, racial equity and justice projects. Those will continue to move forward. Um, our outreach um, to law enforcement will continue uh, to have discussions. And again, look at, looking at uh, ways we continue to work with them, um, build our partnerships. We'll continue working on the pilot projects as mentioned. Uh, those projects are all in motion right now. Uh, the teams are, are meeting with um, OG racial equity and they're meeting internally um, on their own to, again, cultivate uh, concepts. They're in kind of phase one of their process with this. The Winters Group will prov uh, provide their uh, group cu cu cultural audit data uh, to you next month on the, at the April 13th meeting. Then the recruitment for the special assistance of the GM will begin uh, very soon. I believe that is already working its way through uh, recruitment right now. And um, that will, again, be posted um, as soon as that comes up in rotation for posting. And then we'll continue to update and seek direction from the board on, on any items that you have. And at this point, we do want to kind of open the door for any questions or comments that you have regarding uh, where we are in the process or things that you are, are uh, um, interested or concerned about. Director McIntyre. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you, Derry, um, first of all. But I, I, with everything that's going on in the world today, I, I thought maybe we would lose momentum 
on this project, um, but I'm happy to hear that that's not taking place uh, because complacency is how we got here in the first place. So Derry, keep pushing um, and, and let the board know if there's anything else that you need to make this happen. And last but not least, Clifford, thank you for your commitment and leadership um, with this project. Uh, it's extremely important, not just to me, but to the district as a whole. So thank you. Thank you. Director Mellon. Oh, you're on mute. CalPERS had its, uh, what do they call it there, General Assembly. And today's session, unfortunately, uh, conflicted with uh, what I had as committee meetings. And it was on unconscious bias. And I watched it for as long as I could. And then I got into uh, you know, what I had. But if there is a way of getting that presentation that would be really helpful. Um, it was really quite remarkable. And uh, I thought that the presenter did a, a super job, like I say, unfortunately. But he also had a worksheet that was rather interesting. And it had a, uh, you know, it's, it's entitled Unconscious Bias, A Quiet Performance Killer. And that worksheet can be downloaded. I, I'll, I tried to figure out how to forward it, but uh, it, I don't know if it's a useful tool at this stage of the game, but I certainly would encourage uh, taking a look at it. We'll, we'll see what we can do to get that. Uh, Director Young? Yeah, um, just I want to echo um, Lisa's um, support um, for the for the progress and diligence that's that's happening and um, I do want to also I, um, I think you know what Frank just mentioned about unconscious bias training but I was thinking about what yeah. work uh, we can and should do yeah. within the board um, milieu of our organization because yeah. we've largely turned been turning our attention to staff and um, a customer, all of that's right, but I do think that there's a component of it that we need to bring into the boardroom. And so I'd like to, I don't know if that, if, if you've got that calendared somewhere um, uh, for us um, or whether we should be adding that into our, uh, into our program. We can, um, uh, just, I'll discuss that with Derry and we'll see how we can build that in. Uh, I, I would like to uh, agree that it would be good to receive uh, uh, recommendations and to, to get that consulting support from uh, our staff and the Winters Group about what we can do uh, at the board, what's our role. Um, I'm, I'm, I would be glad to hear uh, from uh, colleagues as well as our staff and consultants about what, what's our role and our part um, uh, that, that in, that, in this project. Uh, we, it's great to hear about the progress through these milestones. Uh, the board received a lot of uh, information and provided feedback about the scope at the very beginning of the process. So uh, we haven't really had a great opportunity to really um, engage in the substance and the outcomes uh, because that's not really what these updates have been facilitating. And I'm okay with that um, because uh, I, I respect that there is a lot of work that needs to be done um, in, in, in within each of these steps and that each of these steps do interlink. Um, so it's great to see that there will be um, uh, this presentation in April, um, that this, this audit, uh, that looks like a, a, a welcome opportunity to uh, be able to receive a, a, a deeper dive into the substance of, of where that piece of the project is. So I'm looking forward to that and um, reserving some time at our meeting um, for as much appropriate discussion as, as needed. Thank you, and, and um, just as a heads up, that will be a, a longer discussion in April, so. Great, Bill, go ahead. You have to take yourself off mute. Oh, okay. I got the mute off. Uh, I think one of the 
the things that struck me today is the five strategies and the possibilities through those strategies to see a difference very quickly. And one of the ones that people continue to remind me of is that people working in now uh, different units and how they work their way up the chain to take advantage of some of the positions. Uh, in the past, we did a lot of going outside of the district, so to speak, and bringing in new blood, and it always didn't have the right mix. So I'm glad to hear that you've adopted these strategies, and through them, I think it will make a difference in terms of what you can see. But what really gets accomplished is when you get the ideas and the people working together on particular problems and bringing to that uh, vista their input and seeing how their ideas can make a change in East Bay Mud in this regard. I think that's some self accomplishment that a person can see and understand and feel. So um, I got some of my old books out from 10 years ago. And you'd be surprised that some of them are touching on the very thing that we are executing today. They were just ideas in books 10 years ago. So carry on, carry on. Thank you, Bill. Any other questions, comments? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Derry. Thank you, Derry. Uh, last um, attached is the uh, monthly report, and I can answer any questions you may have. Um, I will say, while everything on the in the monthly report is noteworthy, I, I do want to highlight under the infrastructure investment, the party chemical plant chemical shafts or feed shafts project. That's where we uh, drilled two uh, shafts into Party Tunnel up country. That was a very complicated, high-risk project that required a lot of coordination between engineering, construction, operations, and maintenance, and that was successful. So um, I want to thank uh, the many, many staff um, that made that project successful. That's great. Um, so we'll move now to reports and director comments. Uh, committee reports, minutes from the February 23rd, 2021 Finance Administration Committee were included in the agenda packet. We'll now receive a report from today's Planning uh, and Legislative Human Resources Committee meetings. Uh, director Young, you want to start? You're on mute. Oh, right. Planning committee. Sorry, <laughs> done these before. New rule. Yeah. The shoes on the other foot. The shoes on the other foot. Um, <laughs> um, let me. I got to pull up the pot. The. Uh, I have to pull up the agenda. Um, uh, the policy or the planning committee met this morning and um, got uh, reports on our. Uh, let's see if I can do this by memory. Our private sewer lateral program. Uh, pump station um, work in um, Alameda um, that's quite co complicated. Um, our annual water quality uh, report, which I'm happy to say we, you know, again, meet uh, and exceed all safe drinking water standards that we're still working on the uh, trihalomethanes and, and other disinfection byproducts that will, will be eventually really dealt with by our Rinda uh, treatment plan upgrade um, uh, and our overall compliance um, annual report. Again, um, uh, really, uh, I'd say a good A minus report on, on overall compliance from uh, really good work on worker safety um, all the way through managing um, uh, some of the mishaps that uh, ding us from the the uh, the water board, um, and I 
there was five items. That's why I'm it's, missing it's, it's, one. Satellite recycled uh, water. Ah, our satellite recycled water uh, program to um, help uh, golf course, primarily golf courses and country large users of, of irrigation water to uh, switch over to uh, recycled water if that is something they're able to do. So we got an update on that. Um, and yeah, good meeting. Thank you. Uh, John, you want to tell us about the legislative human resources? Sure, I'll be real quick. We actually dealt with all the items on our uh, under determination today. And what I'd like to point out is uh, Marlene actually handed off to both Jennifer Williams and Debbie Michaels, or Michael, the opportunity to make the presentations and she was there to be providing any backup that might have been needed. So I really appreciate the effort that she was giving to her staff to be able to uh, have more interface with us and uh, leadership growth. So just kudos on that effort. And we dealt with the items and on the agenda today. Oh, that's great. Uh, other items for future consideration, please submit uh, items for future consideration to the general manager. Uh, and then at this time, are there any director comments? I just have one. Um, I presented to the Conacosta Mayor's Conference last Thursday night uh, on our current water supply and rates. And I need to give a huge shout out to Catherine Horn. I know there's other people involved, but she provided the PowerPoint, did all the outreach, did a great job. And then uh, some of the senior staff, uh, like Cliff and, and David and Catherine and Sophie were there as backup with, for any questions that might've been needed. And um, I'm actually having more re some of the rotaries and other groups are now reaching out for presentations. So uh, I'm not big on doing PowerPoints via video, but that's the new world, the new realm. And uh, but I really appreciate staff's effort on making it work so seamlessly. So thank you. Great, yes, uh, similarly, I, I held a word event and uh, uh, the public affairs staff uh, did an excellent job uh, supporting uh, the work needed to get that presentation, including the PowerPoint. Uh, so much appreciation to uh, all of our staff that uh, helped with that uh, presentation. Great. Any other director comments? All right, not seeing any. Uh, the next board meeting uh, will be held Tuesday, March 23rd, uh, 2021 at 1 15. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Stay safe and be well, everyone.